very, very important uh, place of truth with regard to strategies for breaking powerful spiritual influences in your marriage and all and any of your most precious relationships, even relationships at work and at church and other places of that uh, nature. Anywhere that you have a fellowship with people, very, very important that we recognize the truth based on how we interact with people when we're in a very stressful, difficult, conflicted situation. So I'll come from the context uh, predominantly from marriage or connection between a man and a woman uh, that maybe is intending to get married or they're struggling, uh, headed toward divorce. But this also is extremely important with a, a parent child, a mother, son, mother, daughter, father, son, father, daughter, brother, sister, all your extended family, uh, whatever relationship you have, any dual relationship, you want to be sure from the word of God, not from opinions that I have for you. You don't want my opinions. You want the truth. So uh, when the conflict between you and those you love appears to escalate far beyond your ability to marry, uh, to manage, and that can happen quite a bit, you've got to be absolutely careful that you're not under the powerful spiritual influences that far exceeds your ability to resolve. In other words, you're dealing more with spirit power in the conflict with the other person or other people. It can be you and a small group of people or a large group of people. In all situations, this applies. This will never be wrong because the word of God settled forever in heaven. All right, so whatever the issues might be, well, how it is escalating and where it's taking you, you get, you need to be very, very careful because you run the risk of at the end of the matter and the conflict ha being in a much worse place than you ever were before. And then the Lord has to do damage control. Why? Because we relegated to the place of flesh rather than walking after the spirit. Okay, so your mind of flesh is not capable of governing this darkness ever. You're no match for the darkness of enemy spirits that have been come against you. That's Ephesians 6, 12. You've heard us quote it many times. We don't deal with flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. Any wrestling match that you and I are in, that it's only us, our mind of flesh, our thoughts, our own strength, means that the power of the Holy Spirit is not a part of it. You might say, but the Holy Spirit's in me, so he's automatically a part of it. No, he's not. The truth is God wants you and I to invoke his presence in the name of Jesus, Lord, going into this situation. Even when the conflict is going on, you can actually be in communion with the Holy Spirit to bring him to the place so that you follow these truths as you continue in this interaction with that person. You know, Paul writes in Romans 8, chapter 8, verse 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Did you know that even though you can say you love God as a believer in Christ, but you're trusting in yourself, you're actually exhibiting hostility within your soul against God. You can say, I don't feel that way. That's not my intention. Doesn't matter. There is nothing in the flesh that pursues after God. There's nothing in the flesh that God will desire. He desires nothing of our flesh. It's putrid. It's corrupt. That's all through the scriptures. So the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. That's verse seven. And, and it says again, the mindset on the flesh means the mind that is governed by the flesh, controlled by the flesh, and set upon fleshly things. Nothing is good in the flesh. It's all wicked. It's none that seeketh after God in the flesh. This person is hostile toward God. And what does hostile mean? Hatred, enmity. That is, it's like your number one enemy. And bitter opposition against God. Now that script uh, uh, I got from uh, the... Rightly dividing the word of truth from one passion ministries. Those two or three sentences are very important. When your corrupt mind of flesh is engaged against the enemy, plays right in to the enemy's hands. You become his. You are operating according to his influence. You think it's your thoughts, your ideas, your strategies. No, he's giving you all of that. Just because you don't hear his voice. He whispers into your mind. 
He massages your mind in the spiritual realm. So you're not necessarily hearing words. You're having word thought, but those word thoughts are completely influenced by him. You don't want to be following after him. So when your corrupt mind of flesh is engaged against the enemy, it plays right into his hands. This means that you are defenseless against all spiritual enemies. You have no defense, none. They're not just going to go away on you either. They're just going to get more powerful and strong in their influence uh, through you. So when it's you alone coming against that evil in the spiritual realm, you lose before you even engage the enemy. You've lost before you started. And you can't get yourself out of it by wiggling through your flesh-based strategies. All they're going to do is wind you in deeper and down that uh, place of that uh, spiral and that whirlpool of darkness. That's what they're going to do, take you there. So you must first invoke the highest spiritual authority in the universe, the most high God. The Holy Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, you invoke his presence right there. You begin there and you don't go anywhere else but through him and him through you. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you're the branches. Now, if you're a branch of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're attached to the vine, the life of the vine is the only life you have in you. If you are broken from the vine and you're going into the flesh nature, there is no life coming through you. It's a dead life. You're a walking dead man or woman from a spiritual life point of view. And why would we do that when we have been made anew through the power of the Holy Spirit in us? His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are his children. That means his strength comes through spirit to spirit. Holy Spirit to my human spirit. His wisdom comes through. His power, his glory, his mercy, his grace, all comes through spirit to spirit. So what are we doing when we start operating as if we're in charge? Oh, God help us. You know, it's like the song, I did it my way. You never, ever want to go through this life doing anything your way. It is either his way or you don't want that way at all. You can't find one place in scripture where a man or a woman did it according to their ideas, their flesh, their designs, their strategies, and it went well. To the contrary, it it took them into places where God had to, to come in and restore them when they cried out and essentially said, Father, forgive me because I have not trusted in you for what I have done here. And there are situations all through the scripture. The one that always comes to my mind is David, a man after God's own heart. He had this better idea to transport the Ark of the Covenant. God's uh, very precise details uh, with specificity uh, for transporting the Ark were there for a purpose. It was to protect. And David thought, well, you know what? Kind of like that Ford commercial. Ford has a better idea. He put wheels on it. And the thing was, in the terrain that it was going over, it started to tip. And one of the men just went to try to steady it. Boom, dead. He, he was killed immediately because he did. He was not of the priestly order. He was not uh, uh, allowed to touch the Holy of Holies. He, it, it, everything went wrong with what David had done. And he, he had to repent for it. But he thought he had a good idea. But it was not truth. It was his opinion. This, again, is why I'm so careful to keep repeating to people that happen to listen to us, you want only the word of truth and counsel. You do not want the opinions of other people, even if the opinions seem like they make sense. It's not about them making sense. It's about you getting set free. Well, somebody making sense to you doesn't set you free of the entanglement of your bondage or of your blindness. And Jesus said, I came to give sight to the blind. That is of the mind. So you can see what the devil has not let you see and to be set free of the captivity of the stronghold in your heart. Well, that can only be done by the finished work of Jesus at Calvary. No counselor's opinions can ever set you free. No licensure in psychology, psychiatry, no degrees, none of that will set people free. And it'll give them a, a therapeutic protocol, uh, maybe a pharmaceutical protocol of what pills you take. And I'm not saying 
that you shouldn't do that, but don't ever expect to be set free in the spiritual realm. When people come to the counselor, the psychologist, psychiatrist, they're not coming to have their soul be studied. They're coming to have their soul restored. Only Christ can do that. Think about this. If any other way was available, like all these counselors, well, then why did Christ die to set us free? He wouldn't have needed to die, but it took the price of the only begotten Son of God, his blood, his broken body, for the remedy that will only set us free. And, and you will never find someone who sat at the, the feet of a counselor or, or a therapist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and they'll tell you they were set free by them. If they were set free, it was only by Christ. The problem is uh, what we often refer to as tolerable recovery, where they feel a little bit better because they learned some methods to try to cope and try to live with the disorder that was just causing all the great torment in their lives. Try to live with it. God said, I came to set the captives free, Jesus said. I came to set at liberty the captives. He wants to set us free. He won't be done sitting down, talking about our problems, suffering from the paralysis of analysis. Well, this has happened and then this happened and this is where the conflict was. We'll never get set free that way. It's a word of God settled forever in heaven. It's through Calvary. If the two people that are in conflict are coming together, and they had a time apart because they just were so toxic they couldn't be with one another. They somehow found their ways back to one another. Oh, good. Happy days are here again, right? There were not happy days before. There were tolerable days. And what they're actually saying is, I've had enough time away. I think we can try it again. But when the very things that caused them to split, husband and wife, split in the first place, have not been addressed, and they find their, their way back to each other to try to connect, it can't work. It can't work. There might be a bit of a false honeymoon period and within another two, three weeks or more or less, they're apart again. Why? The iniquity that was in one or both, and usually there's something in both that has not been cleansed, has now emerged. And the enemy's playing this shell game with all of us, making us feel these false hopes and then we come to the place where we have no hope anymore. Why? We tried to come back to, uh, to each other many times. Now, some of you say, you know what? We did come back together and we made it work. I guarantee you this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If the iniquities were not cleansed or dealt with, it's a very cold communion of romance. Very cold. And it, 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 it is not real. It does not have the depth of heart. It does not have sacrificial love where you put the needs of the other person so beautifully above your own and they do the same thing to you. Why? Because the spirit of the Lord is not in the place where that iniquity still aches within your soul. And that's what's causing all the conflict. That's why we're doing this session. Because when you're engaged in that type of conflict that is eroding your communion and your connection, the enemy uses that to wear you both down to eventually one says, I can't be around you. And that's exactly what happened in my marriage. And 35 years ago, I was, my wife said, I, I love you. I don't want a divorce, but I can't be around you. And what she was saying was whatever that darkness is in you, it's, it's, it's getting into me and it was getting into the kids. See, because the enemy is not satisfied with having um, a captivity over one in the family. I call it a dark shroud the enemy puts over them. They're depressed, angry all the time, losing their temperament. They're filled with fear and anxiety. They're never at peace. They, they can't sleep at night. And if they do, they don't get enough rest. And the enemy puts that shroud, has that shroud over that person. Well, what the enemy does then is he wants that person to put that shroud over the rest. So his pain uh, as in my case, my torment became the torment of everybody around me. You have anybody like that near you or around you? Praise God it, that that I started to look in and look up, not look out and say this, she needs to change, he needs to change. God said, as you go, so will the rest. Not, it won't be perfect, but you're going to be set free of the things that are poisoning your soul and to making toxic your soul. It doesn't have to be that way. That meant all the conflicts 
were at the center of that toxicity. So my toxicity created a provocation. You know, the Bible says, provoke your children, not your children to wrath. I was doing that. I was provoking my kids to wrath. And it was that spirit, that iniquity. You can't make that go. You can't reason that out. You can't use the mind of flesh and think it's going to go. It, it gets in there stronger. It becomes a stronghold. It's fortified by other enemy spirits or the strength of the enemy spirit there. That's why it's called the strong man. The strong man anchors the stronghold. The strong man must be bound and cast out. Only in the name of Jesus will that happen. So Jesus said, for without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5, everything we're talking about here for you to get the peace and the victory and the restoration you need right now, right here. You can act on it right here. You don't have to go another day with this. So let's look, because we always like to put the strategies out there. What's the point of saying, here's the problem, laying it right out and you say, wow, that's what's happening to me. <gasps> Praise God, I know it's wrong. Well, that's not enough to know what's wrong. How about to know what to do to be set free and do it? But the part on you is the obedience to do it. So you're going to know how to get set free. Any other strategy or method of attack that does not involve the Lord Jesus and the power of his name results in you losing the battle that only he can win. Strategy number one. Look, we're getting right into, okay, what do I do? When you are provoked into an argument, that is really getting into an intense conflict. Even before that, don't engage. Don't engage. I trust you know what that means. Don't revile back. Don't conflict back. Don't add to it. Well, they said they need a response. I need to respond to them. Who said? Who said? God is actually internally with words of the Holy Spirit to them, even if they're not believers. God is still bearing witness to them, um, a conviction upon them, at least in their conscience, if they're not believers. But if they're believers, he will bring a conviction to them, but you won't notice it. So you'll think, that, well, they're not getting, you know, what they need to understand what they're doing to me. No, this is not the time to try to get them to see all that it's doing to you. This is not the time. This is a war going on. It's a spiritual war. Don't engage. Don't engage. So what are you to do? If you're not to engage... You're to appeal to the Lord from your spirit and let them, you know, wah, wah, wah. It's kind of like Snoopy Dog. He never did say much, but he did a lot of wah, wah, wah. You can actually be protected from those senseless words that might be coming at you, but do not revile back. All you're doing is stepping into the place of the flesh if you do that. When you engage, now you, I just said, don't engage. When you engage, you become a patsy for the devil. You're a patsy. You're a little puppet pat patsy. You need to see yourself like that. You know, it's like that old song years ago. Everybody plays the fool. Now I'm playing the fool. Oh, I, I was the number one patsy and fool. And if I'm not careful, I can be again. Don't be a patsy for the devil. Well, let's define it. A person who is easily manipulated and victimized. Real easily. A pushover. A coward. I was a coward. I was a patsy. I was a coward. Why? Because I had to have my say and my way. When I had to have my way and my say, what was I doing operating after the flesh? Was the Holy Spirit in that? Not at all. Not at all. Well, I prayed before it. No, the Holy Spirit's not part of that. Nope. He will not in any way come through you, the Holy Spirit, when you are operating in the flesh and you're at enmity with God and you are completely attacking in hostility the living God. Here you are, right? Poor me. Poor me. I've got to do something. Don't do it. Trust God. Watch what he does. So don't engage in any way, invoke the Spirit of God for peace within you in the name of Jesus and ask the Lord for wisdom. But the wisdom, first of all, to keep silent, to keep silent, and the wisdom to be able to walk away and not revile back. So be careful being the patsy. The only thing that is drawing you into the fight is your pride. Well, how how healthy is pride? Well, ask, ask the devil. Read about him. It was his pride and arrogance that cost him heaven, his heavenly place at shielding the throne of God. Lucifer, star of the morning. 
He was so beautiful in the creation that God had made him. Oh, to imagine pride so thick, so dark, so deceptive that the creature, the most powerful creature in heaven was actually thought he could subvert the throne of God. That's blindness. And that's what you and I go into when we start to revile back, when we start in flesh to try to get our argument position back. No, don't engage. Don't. You lose. You will never win. You know who only wins in these conflicts between two people, especially believers, husband, wife, father, son, whatever it might be. The only ones who win are the, the devils. The devils. We're wrestling them. They're kicking this off. They're, they can't make us get this way. But we're, we're submitting. We're allowing them to take us into this darkness and this conflict. Again, we become patsies. So the only thing drawing you into the fight is your pride, which is all flesh. And you end up surrendering your desire to be healed for the sake of being right. That's so foolish. Question to you, do you want to be right or do you want to be healed? But the truth is, you're not right. When you revile back, but, but my position is right doesn't matter. It's only right in your own eyes. Whenever Israel did everything that was right in their own eyes, they were in the worst and deepest rebellion, ready to go into, uh, you know, slavery of another nation. They did what was right in their own eyes. Kind of familiar, isn't it? That's what's happening. Look around you. The people without Christ, the people without God. They're doing right in what they think is right in their own eyes. Um, you know, this Proverbs fourteen twelve says that there seems a way unto a man um, that he is right. There seemeth a way unto a man that he is right, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. I kind of changed it a little and paraphrased that first part. There seemeth a way that is right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. That is that is scary because the man thinks he's right. How many times I thought I was right? Ask people that aren't believers, why should, why should God let you into his heaven? And they say, well, I'm not as bad as certain people and I tried to do right. That seems so right to them. I remember that. Because I came late, I was 22 when I came to the Lord. Those are the things I would say. That I, you know, I didn't try to do wrong things. That has nothing to do with salvation. Christ, his finished work at Calvary is what gave us salvation. And it's nothing that we do or don't do. It's placing our faith in the finished work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. But what seemed right to us, the ends thereof are the ways of death the death, the eternal death, into the lake of fire, going into a Christless eternity, to be eternally separated from God with never the chance again. It's in the word. People say, that seems harsh. Think about what we did. Think about what we do now, even as believers. Think about the cost that Father God had to send and the cost to the Son. How dare we? Wow. That's how blind the enemy can make us because he'll always give us those reasons. Well, those are my thoughts. No, they're not. They come out as your thoughts and they have parts of your thoughts in them, but ultimately we're being duped and we're becoming patsies. So this is where uh, the only thing that is drawing you into the fight is pride. So pride is the most destructive force in the universe, right? It's at the base of all sin. It's doing it my way. It's doing it after the flesh. And you end up surrendering your desire to be healed for the sake of being right. Okay. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. This verse now applies to us, not just to the heathen now. They profess themselves to be wise. Romans one twenty two. all the while they're fools. Oh, they think they're so smart. Oh, they think they're so clever. Oh my, they thought of things nobody else thought of and they're manipulating behind the scenes and they're saying, we'll do this and we'll be in control of everyone and we'll have that control. They're professing themselves to be wise, but they became fools. There is no worse place to be besides lost. And that the problem is the foolishness 
is a, somebody who's headed to being lost if they're not lost already. So you got to be very careful. But I say unto you, because we got to be careful calling anyone a fool, I need to make sure I bring that in here. Matthew 5, 22, it's very clear and Jesus is talking. I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, that's any other human being, shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Raka, which is defined meaning uh, means a worthless or empty vessel person. You're calling them less than, uh, almost less than being a person. Worthless, empty, of no value whatsoever. And the council means the, uh, the spiritual council, corporate council, of the heavenly realm that confers upon you and I the anointing that he gives us to the priest, the anointing, to the prophet, the anointing, and so on. That council is ultimately evaluating constantly what God has breathed in you and through you for the purposes for his perfect will through you and your destiny. But when we start operating in words of judgment, consigning to people God won't have it, and we're in danger of the council and in danger of hellfire. Be careful. So you don't want to throw this around. Can you describe a person as ha being foolish at times? Yeah, I'm foolish at times. Uh, we've all done that. Again, the song, everybody played the fool, right? I don't want to put any uh, any emphasis on, on that song being a word of truth. It's not. But it's a pathetic sort of, uh, you know, description of a person in a position where they're clearly operating under their own flesh or their own strength, and there's nothing healthy in it. It's just taking them deeper into confusion, into darkness, into the loss of power of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing good about it. So we become patsies, and when we're not careful, we become foolish and fools, okay? We can become, I'm not consigning that to any particular person, and all, all because of what? All because of being led by enemy spirits who have who have uh, confused us, who have given us a way that is not of God, and who has promised us what he can never deliver. So in the Bible, a fool is one who has rebelled against God. When we call someone a fool as a sign of our hatred toward them, then it is sinful. But saying someone is being foolish because they're rebelling against God, and it's true, we've done them a favor. The word fool doesn't signify a person that's ignorant, meaning that they know better. It signifies a person who knows there's a God, but operates in his life as if there is no God. And that's, that's why it says in the Bible, only a fool would say in his heart, there is no God. You might say, well, why, why that word used? And why, if they say they're atheists, they're called a fool because they say there's no God. Because that which may be known in us, all of us, is the existence of God so that we are without excuse. Read Romans 1 and 2. You will see by his handiwork, by creation itself, it reveals the God that we cannot see. And also when God breathed in our human spirit, he breathed it in at the point of conception. That's why the baby is fully alive and a full life at the point of conception. And he breathed in the knowledge of him. So when a person says there is no God, their spirit or their spirit is dead in sin, but even within their soul, it's crying out, there is a God. There is no God, they say. There is a God. There is a God. I know there's a God. And that's why it's interesting when a person is facing calamity and potential and imminent death. Oh my God. Oh my God. In, in almost all cases, they don't say, oh, oh, uh, uh, the Hindu God. What's his name? Krishna. Oh, Krishna. Oh, Mohammed. Oh, 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 um, Mary Baker Eddy. She's uh, founded Christian science. You don't hear him saying that. Oh God. Oh God. That which may, may be known of him is in us is in us. That's why the Bible says only a fool would say in his heart there is no God because his own heart bears witness of the God that breathed life into him. Oh my. 
so, so the person's under the darkness of the enemy and believing the lie. Uh, so, so don't engage in conflict, number one. Two, don't walk after the flesh. Don't, anything you do, anything you do, you get in that conflict, you're after the flesh. You revile back, you plan certain things to make that person feel your pain, punish them, you're in the flesh. It's all flesh. None of it is of God. No matter how justified you feel, you think you are. Jesus said, going to a cross of the very people crucifying him, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he never sinned. He never did anything wrong and he's forgiving them while they're doing that to them, uh, to him. So what, what, what cause do we have to use that conflict in some way to revile on them so we feel better in the flesh? There is no feeling better in the flesh. It's corrupt. So don't walk after the flesh. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So you're not under condemnation even when you sin, but you ask God to forgive your sin. First John 1, 9. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Right there it is. All flesh reaps corruption. Boom, done. There is no no healthy thing that comes out of anything you and I do in the flesh on in the spiritual realm. Um, but he that soweth to the spirit, that is capital S, Holy Spirit, shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. This is Galatians 6, 8, comparing flesh with spirit. Now, right here it is that we can only, only allow God to move and to work in our lives and our loved ones even if they're coming against us, even if we have come against them, we are to sow after the spirit, walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Answer the matter only with the word of truth because you're wrestling an enemy spirit. That's the third thing. Any matter that you answer, the, and, and no make a conflict. Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love. Answer the matter with the word of truth. You might say, yo, well, I've tried that and he just came back to me all the worse or she came back to me all the worse. Giving the word of truth without provocation, speaking the truth in love, regardless of the response, that doesn't make what you did wrong. That's another thing we get, we get, uh, you know, deceived on. Oh boy, that went well. Did you see how that person reacted? Don't base it on their reaction, that reveals them. See, when they get into this conflict, they're after the flesh, you can stay quiet. They will reveal more about them and what's really in them and who they are than they will about you. Let them reveal them. So, this is so important, but the enemy's got you all charged up in your pride. I'm not going to take that. I'm not going to let them. I'll tell them a thing or two. You know, you have an eye problem. I'm this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to say this. Who had the eye problem? <laughs> Look in Isaiah 14, I think it is. Five I wills that Satan said before he was backhanded out of heaven. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven into the darkness, never to enter again. I will rise above the stars of God. I will rise up the sides of the north. I, Satan, <laughs> that didn't work out very well for him. So be careful. When you get into the I will this and I will that and I want this and I want that, you're speaking the enemy's language right there. So be careful. If you sow after the flesh, you sow corruption. So answer the matter with the word of truth and walk away, be done with it. Don't do it in there for an argument. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you you make sure you leave the conflict with the word of truth. You then speak it into the heavenly realm and let God do with it through his only spirit. Let him bear witness with their spirit, the wisdom of that truth that you just put up there. Go to the highest authority. Don't make it about you and that person. Make it about you and the Lord go rise above the highest authority. All this could end. This could end, as you say it does. Well, I can't change him. Now you got it. You never could. Stop trying. And God doesn't want you to get in his way when he's in the change mode, when he's in the transformation of them. Did you ever wonder why sometimes he wants you to be used as the vessel of their transformation? I said the vessel. Not your strength, not what you did at Calvary, because you, you and I didn't do anything at Calvary. 
what he did at Calvary. But if that's embodied in us, God will use it. So always end with a blessing, a prayer, and a loving action in spite of what they did or said to you. Uh, where do we see that? That's three verbs, by the way. It's 544 Matthew. Jesus is talking. And he said, but I say unto you, love your enemies. You might say, wait a minute, you're talking about my spouse here. Yeah. Did you ever really evaluate how we act toward our spouses? We become their worst enemies. Okay. Now this also refers to literal enemies, but we become their worst enemies. This should not be. When you're one with that person, why would you curse them? Why would you accuse them? You're cursing yourself and accusing them because the two become one flesh. You're, you're, you're completely poisoning the oneness. And again, revealing you more than them, or in their case, if they're doing it, revealing them more than you. So love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You might say, well, what if they don't change? Well, that's not on you. You and I are called to do this truth, whether they want to or desire to or not. But you win even when they get, if they get worse. If they get even worse in the way they're coming against you, you will be rising above the power of that coming against you. The curses will not stick. The, the re accusations, which is what the devil does, he's the accuser of the brethren, the accusations will not stick, nor the curses. And what will happen is the Spirit of God will go into the places of that darkness, and the, for, it'll bring, uh, take away condemnation in you, because you don't have condemnation in you as a believer, as long as you don't regard iniquity in your heart and you've asked God to forgive you. Uh, and it brings into the darkness of them deep conviction. Conviction to want to repent before God. You're actually sending them to the throne of God. That's what you're doing. They're right there in front of you. But spiritually, you're sending them right to the throne of God. But not, you're not saying that. You're not saying, I send you to the throne of God. When you ha bless those who curse you, the blessing comes on you, and the result of the curse comes on them. And it's very painful. And the curse is used by God for the person because the believers are cursed when they do these things like anybody else and it causes them to cry out and repent. So God uses the curse and, and the torment of the curse to cause his people to repent. That was his purpose even after the fall. And we say, boy, he's neat, mean. No, he's loving. Because remember what the flesh does? It rejects God, it's hostile toward God, it never seeks after God. What does the curse do? Causes that man or woman to start to look in the direction of God and, and it begins to have them fall on their knees and repent and come to the end of their se themselves. So there's, God uses all this for his purposes and they will never regret the curse. If they come in brokenness and repentance where God restores them, they'll never regret it. And it, it's win-win when you do this. Now, there's strategies here. Are they mine, in my opinion? No, don't give me the credit. This is the word of God. All we've done is pulled it together and given you a strategy to act in thought prayer, in word prayer, in word action, in behavioral action. God wants your uh, all of your doings. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. He, God wants you to be doing the word of God. That right here it is. I'm going to bless you. And you can say, even if you're being cursed, I've used that with people, uh, situations where, you know, it got difficult in some of the counseling sessions and difficult and the enemy would reveal, uh, reveal himself through that person and he would cast aspersions. He would uh, do curses. I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I bless the person, not that spirit. And I rebuke that spirit coming through you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd do it right there. You don't need to yell. They're not deaf. Okay? But bring the truth. Bring the truth. But see, the enemy tries to put a gag order on you. You've noticed that, haven't you? He can't do it literally, but it makes you feel like, I'm not speaking now. Uh-oh. What could happen here? Don't be afraid. God is protecting you. 
God is protecting you. He will only allow so much, but he's also, he's positioning you and he's preparing you to take that position. And this is your training. This is your discipleship. That's why our ministry is more discipleship than it is counsel. It has all the counsel it did before and more, but it doesn't stop at counsel. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Counsel is hearing the word, but if we don't walk you in it, that is doing the word. That The transformation won't be complete. And that's what this is about. So I trust you're going to make a commitment right now as we close in prayer. So always end with a blessing, a prayer, a loving action. In spite of what they did or said to you, once again, Matthew 5, 44. Read it. Put it in your heart and say those verbs and say, I bless this person. You don't have to do it in front of them. They don't have to know. But do it in intercession whenever you're away from them as God leads you. Let's pray for this prayer of restoration. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, no one is exempt from the possibility of being drawn in uh, to a conflict, especially with those most precious in our lives, starting with spouse, son, daughter, uh, acquaintances, close friends, people, church, people at the workplace, people in our social sphere, whatever it might be. Lord, we are making a commitment. We're not going to engage. We're not going to respond and revile if we're reviled. We're not going to accuse when we're accused. Uh, we're not going to curse when we are cursed. We're rather going to bless those who curse us, Lord. And we're going to pray for those that despitefully use us and do good to them that hate us according to your perfect word. We're not going to engage no more, Lord. We're not going to do it. We're going to engage you where they're trying to engage us under the influence of enemy spirit activity. And we're going to love them. We're going to love them with uh, intercession and let God have them, put them into his hands. And Father God, we pray that you would show us our iniquities. And when you do that, we will repent for those iniquities and ask you to forgive us. And anything that is standing in the way of repentance going forth, reveal it to us so that we can surrender that situation to you, Father God. We receive not because we ask not. And we close with this. If we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And let that be the blessing over all who hear. Now and in the days ahead, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And don't forget, you and your loved ones walking through Calvary, signups are already beginning for our September class. And we're just now starting August uh, between our two classes. So come and join us throughout August. And we start and begin in September. God bless you. See you soon.